twice mayor of Penzik. Yeah. Hello. Um, I, I think everybody that's in here, perhaps, uh, how, how do we pronounce that? Al Tariq? Um, uh, I think he's the only one here that wasn't here for the for my original greeting opening. Um, anyway, I'm Devin. Uh, I have been doing a lot of service stuff pretty much my entire life, even pre-SCA. Um, every job that I've had has been in a serving profession. Um, I uh, did professional ambulance work for a long time. I was a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, so yeah, so even before the SCA, it's always been my thing. In the SCA, um, I was autocrat of a local event, a camping event here uh, some time back and, uh, and then kind of shifted over to Penzik and most of my volunteer stuff has all been related to Penzik in somehow, you know, some way or another. Um, I was the East Kingdom Chirurgeon for six years, which meant that I had the privilege <laughs> of running Chirurgeon's Point at Penzik which was uh, a logistical nightmare, <laughs> but, uh, but we pulled it off every year and uh, it worked well. Um, one of the things that I did that uh, actually turned out very well, I believe the Middle Kingdom had a Kingdom Chirurgeon who was essentially brand new um, to both the SCA and to Penzik, um, but her medical background was awesome. And she bumped into some kind of a significant problem at her first turn being the, uh, the war chirurgeon. And uh, she, uh, she came to me and you know, was looking for advice. What do we do? How does this work? And, uh, and I stepped right up and I said, you know, I have an idea. This is the first time that I'm aware of that we've had a kingdom chirurgeon who didn't have Penzik experience and ended up in charge of Penzik. So I think, how about if we institute a policy where on the off year, the Kingdom Chirurgeon, say for example, I was the Kingdom Chirurgeon for the East and it was now the middle's turn to run the war. Well, I was their number two, I was their deputy. This way they had somebody that they had immediate access to if they had a question about something that came up, didn't know how to do something, needed help with a solution. They had somebody who already had experience running Penzik as their backup. Um, and I believe that stuck around for quite a, quite a few years. Um, it became a, a sort of tradition and it helped to smooth things out. You didn't have to reinvent the wheel every year. Um, Did you find those deputies continued to stay around? Because I know sometimes we have the problem of we have a deputy, deputy mm -hmm. learns everything. And when it's their turn to step in, they're like, mm, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not ready for this now because I'm moving on with my life. Yeah, I, so far as I know the, the, the process or the, the tradition continued for another year or two and then it kind of dropped by the wayside. And, uh, and then Penzik shifted over to having uh, professional paid EMS on site. So that pretty much took a lot of the workload off of the chirurgeon. Um, yeah, but it's, I, I, it was a very good idea at the time <laughs> and it helped, helped a lot. Um, what else? I, I was involved in Penzik right from the very start. Um, in, the, in the mundane world, I was a, an EMT, uh, worked on an ambulance and I was fairly new to the SCA. My first Penzik was Penzik 17. And there was one day, uh, my group, Thescar, was camped at the bottom of Runestone Hill. I think it's where Trimaris is now. Um, and I had gone up to the store to get a bag of ice. And it was hot. It was uh, above 90 degrees. And I trudged my way up the hill and got my little bag of ice and started trudging back toward camp, carrying this bag of ice that I knew would be mostly water by the time I got back to camp. And I paused partway down the hill to just sort of catch my breath. And some guy wearing a red baldric came tootling up the hill in a golf cart and his hair was flying in the breeze and he looked cool. And I looked at that guy and I said, you know, I don't know what that guy is, but I want to be one. And the very next year I was part of the Penzik Chirurgeon and uh, kept going from there. 
Um, so I tell people that I ended up uh, running pens as a chirurgeon because of a golf cart. Um, that's one of the things that, uh, that I mentioned earlier is uh, a lot of volunteer positions have some sort of a perk, you know, even if it's just, uh, you know, free freezy pops every now and then. Um, there's always good, uh, good stuff to be had by volunteering. A lot of camaraderie, um, a lot of learning how other people work so that if you need a volunteer to do something further down the road, you already know that person X is good at whatever. Um, and you can count on them to step up and volunteer. So what kind of perks do you give throughout the planning portion of the event ahead of time? Because obviously at the event, when you can ride the cool golf cart, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's pretty neat when you're there. But the months mm -hmm. ahead of time when you're doing all the planning, riding a golf cart probably doesn't quite get you to keep going. That's <laughs> true. The uh, pre pensic Primarily, it's a matter of knowing that you're going to be giving back to an event. You know, that's one of the things that I heard over and over again from people who volunteer is that they get so much out of Penzik, so much enjoyment, so much participation in the SCA, and they have a feeling that they, they want to give something back to the event. That's why a lot of people volunteer. Um, perks wise, at least when I'm running things, I like to have a lot of fun, you know, and I try to promote that amongst the people that I'm working with. Um, yeah, and, and it can be fun just working with other people. Uh, if you have somebody with a good sense of humor, <laughs> it's always a plus. Um, yeah, and I think I mentioned earlier too that uh, every now and then, at least in some local events, um, they'll waive the entry fee for people who are going to be doing significant volunteering. So that's a perk, knowing that if you go in and help them to set up the event that you won't have to pay to get in. Um, what else? Recognition is one of the perks that comes along later, not pre. Um, so you get those uh, people who are gang pressed into, I mean, you talked about the people who want to give back to the event or have some other connection to it, but certainly you get the people who are gang pressed into an event like that too. Do you find mm -hmm. that they, they are motivated differently? They have different, the way their effort is, they have a different level of effort or? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I think that in the world in general, there are a lot of people who help other people just because it's the right thing to do. You know, and I think that the same thing happens at Penzik. You know, if somebody steps up at the info point and says, we need to move 300 hay bales, can we get some help? There are a lot of people who will say, oh yeah, I'll do it because I'm a fighter, you know, and having the hay bales set up on the battlefield is gonna benefit me. So I'll go help and do that. Good questions. Certainly someone else has some too. I, I can keep on throwing them. I've got lots in my mind. Sure. I'll, I'll throw one out. So you talked about little rewards during the event. Mm -hmm. um, I've autocratted a grand total of one things and that was an interesting experience. Um, mm -hmm. But something I did was, I can be a little silly sometimes as most of us can. And mm -hmm. I had discovered Scooby snacks are like the most amazing graham crackers ever. So I ran around the whole event with a whole bunch of Scooby snacks in my belt mm -hmm. pouch. And if I saw one of my volunteers working and they were doing something cool, I gave them a Scooby snack. And if um, I saw somebody who wasn't a volunteer doing something really cool, I gave them a Scooby snack and mm -hmm. that was kind of fun. And so we laughed and we had Scooby snacks the whole event. There you go. Um, what, uh, in a similar vein, one of the things that I did um, was uh, I do a little bit of leather work. So I had made up a whole bunch of little bracelets. It was just a, a thin strip of leather with a little snap on it. And you put it around your wrist, snap it in place. And it had printed on it in Latin the phrase, Devin saw me do something cool. <laughs> I don't remember what the Latin was, but. And that's what I did. I, I had a bunch of them in a pouch and walking around. If I spotted somebody, 
whether they were a volunteer for the event or not, you know, like I saw some guy helping this lady put up her tent. You know, so I went over and said, that's real cool. You don't know this lady, do you? You just stepped up and helped her put up her tent. Here, take this. And I gave him that little uh, that little bracelet. So yeah, I think I think it was Lee Iacocca did a thing where he would do random tours of some of the auto plants. And he would do the same kind of thing. If he spotted one of the workers do something out of the ordinary, like walking along, the worker would stop and pick up a little piece of trash that was on the floor and walk it over and drop it in the trash can. Lee Iacocca would walk up to that guy, shake his hand, introduce himself, give him a hundred dollar bill and say, keep up the good work and walk away. <laughs> and that the, the news of that kind of thing just spread like wildfire and it helped morale all the way around. So are your bracelets now worth a hundred dollars? I mean, I, I would hope so. <laughs> I haven't seen one in quite a while, but this it was a long time ago. <laughs> so what was one of the bigger problems you encountered? Because I, I got to figure there's some a horror story or two you can relate that, but how you solved it might uh, might give some good insight into the problems that we face at other events. Well, uh, I, a, a very good example was um, I, what I had mentioned earlier, the Mid-Realm Kingdom Kyurgen who hadn't uh, had a lot of Penzik experience. Um, prior to that year, we had an arrangement with the Pennsylvania National Guard that they provided us with filled water buffaloes. Um, they would come along with one of their great big deuce and a half trucks. And they had these, uh, I think three or 500 gallon water tankers, it's just basically a trailer with a big tank on the back. And uh, they would come and place them for us um, to use as water supply on the battlefield and uh, out near the woods and a couple of different other places. Well, we had uh, expected those water buffaloes to show up in this particular Penzik and they didn't show up. And we went and talked to the autocrat who informed us that some person at a mundane sporting event that the National Guard was doing the same thing with the water buffaloes tried to sue the state because they claimed that they got some sort of food poisoning from the water in the water buffalo. So as a result, the governor said to the National Guard, okay, you're not gonna do that anymore. <laughs> And he just shut down that, that whole, pro, that whole uh, program. And we didn't know about it until the event was actually started. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the, the situation where she came up to me and said, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Um, the solution was uh, unique. <laughs> we rounded up a whole bunch of volunteers. We gave them some cash. We said, go into town and buy as many large water containers as you can find. <laughs> and we ended up with this significantly large pile of water things. <laughs> some were five gallon jerry cans, some were those little picnic coolers and just all kinds of different stuff, but we got it done. We got water out to all of the battles as necessary. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that was one of, our, one of our most significant problems that I remember happening at that event. It could have been a complete disaster if we hadn't been able to, you know, very quickly provide a whole lot of water storage. What else? Um, another thing that happens every now and then, uh, I think somebody earlier mentioned the Velociraptor, um, that we've had situations where one of the department heads at Penzik um, at the last minute couldn't attend the event. Um, and they had not arranged for a drop dead deputy. So we had to scramble around and find somebody. We ended up finding somebody who had previously worked that department. So at least they knew what that department did and how it all worked. And we said, okay, you are officially promoted. <laughs> You're now the guy in charge of this, uh, this department. And, uh, and that worked. It's one of the things about the SCA in general that I've really enjoyed. There was a time, I, gosh, my, my memory is uh, awful, <laughs> by the way. I had, uh, I had heart surgery uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, ever since then, my short-term memory's been shot. But uh, we had a, an incident at Penzik where the power went out, which happens every now and then. Um, and I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes after the power went out, 
you had some random skatey and walk into Kyrgyz Point and say, could you guys use a generator? <laughs> and it was like, sure. <laughs> so they uh, they went back down to their camp and brought up a generator and they plugged in all the lights and the refrigerator and stuff up at Kyrgyz Point. And, you know, that was just spontaneous. Like I didn't have to do that, you know, and it was just a matter of, uh, matter of luck that the guy had a generator in camp and they had used it to run some power tools and stuff to put their camp together at the beginning. Um, and and it, the thought occurred to him that, you know, maybe the Kyrgyz could use some power. Boom, done. And the SCA seems to do a lot of that kind of stuff uh, regularly. And I really like that. So one of the things I would emailed you about earlier in the week was uh, finding, recognizing burnout in your staff and, and or yourself and finding ways to fight that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different stuff and it, it happens a lot in the real world as well. You know, like I mentioned, I, I worked on an ambulance for quite a long time and uh, there was a lot of burnout. We did a lot of stuff that was fun. You know, we, uh, we came up with the idea that we were diamonds because what happens if you take something and you burn it down to a chunk of coal and then you put it under tremendous stress and pressure for a very long time, what do you get? You get a diamond. <laughs> so that's what we were, <laughs> you know, we were way past burned out. But the point was that we could joke about it, you know, and it, it helped a lot, you know, just to know. Another thing too is I sort of, taking the time to sit back and reminisce a little bit. You know, when we ran this event X, you know, last year, it was really awesome. You know, we had numbers of people come up after the event and say, wow, that was a great event, thank you. And they did walk away. And by remembering that, it encouraged us and helped to stave off uh, burn up, burnout rather. Um, so fun, recognition, like the thing I mentioned with uh, the Iacocca, you know, uh, write to your royalty, you know, and more importantly, do it yourself if you're the person in charge and do it right then and there, you know, especially if you can do it in front of their peers. You know, I, I had a, a, a situation happened where once again, we needed volunteers to move hay bales out on the main battlefield. And, uh, and I found someone that I knew had a, a household um, of people that tended to do a lot of work. And uh, I said, hey, you know, we could use some help getting all these hay bales moved. And they said, Devin, I'll take care of it. And uh, I went out to the battlefield about an hour later to discover this person and his whole household, like probably 10, 10 or 15 people. They were out there just getting done moving all of these hay bales. And right in the middle of it all, I pulled up in my little golf cart and I got out, walked over. I said, hey, everybody, come here a minute. You see this guy? He organized this for me. That was awesome. And I shook his hand, said, thank you all for helping out. And, uh, and I went away and that left that guy, you know, glowing saying, wow, I did something cool. So that's a, that's a big help. Hmm. Yeah, maintaining enthusiasm depends on the event. <laughs> something like Penzik, it does get pretty difficult as you work your way toward the end of the event where all of the people who have been volunteering regularly were tired and sweaty and starting to say, you know, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> you know, that's the point where it becomes even more critical to try and encourage people, you know, you're doing a good job. Is there anything I can help you with? You know, um, we had a, uh, we, we created a morale department at Penzik and uh, it was their job to drive around in their golf cart and touch base with each of the different department heads or deputies and just random staff people that they were able to identify. And uh, they stopped, they chit chat for a minute. Um, we had one lady who uh, had a constant stream of jokes. Every time she pulled up in front of somebody, you know, she'd pop some little joke and make them laugh and then ask them if they needed anything, whether that was a, you know, a bottle of water or a freezy pop or a piece of pie. Um, or, or if they needed more volunteers to help with whatever they were doing. So that was a big, a big thing as well. Yeah. So I'll throw another one out while, while we have this time. Okay. No one else throwing out some. And that's uh, any experience, 
any advice when dealing with the mundane authorities, as I know that Penzik, of course, has to do that a lot. So. Mm -hmm. Well, at, at Penzik in particular, we actually have a, a position where we have a, a mundane liaison. Um, a couple of years, in fact, the, uh, the fellow who was going to be this year's autocrat, and I guess they're just shifting Penzik 49 to next year, <clears throat> He's actually the Australian equivalent of a federal marshal. Um, and he volunteered to come and work with uh, public safety. And uh, they volunteered him because of what he does in the real world to be the liaison with the uh, mundane authorities. And it happened a lot. You know, we had uh, the state police would show up because they had a, a warrant uh, for somebody or they had a, a summons that they needed to serve. Um, things like that, or a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, but every now and then it was because of, uh, you know, notification, some family emergency, some relative had passed away, or, you know, you're needed back home because X disaster took place. Um, so yeah, they, uh, it wasn't unusual that we, we referred to them as our friends from Butler <laughs> on the radio, because we didn't need to broadcast uh, the entire event that the cops were going to show up. Um, so yeah, it happened fairly regularly, probably on average, I'd say almost once a day, you know, um, that the state troopers would show up for either they showed up on their own or they showed up because we called them. <laughs> and when you had, I mean, I, I guess it was pretty much they come on site and you just you know, dealt, dealt accordingly with what they wanted, but I'm assuming mm -hmm. you were doing a lot of interfacing with them ahead of time, and certainly on some of the utilities and so forth, I would think that, you know, I've certainly heard the rumors about how much Penzik has to, uh, you know, they have to cap it at 10,000, quote unquote, was the old rumor. Yeah. Uh, and, and make sure they had sanitation and certain other things otherwise. So I assume mm -hmm. that, there, I mean, there's just interfacing with the bigger mundane administrations too and bureaucracies. Mm -hmm. Most of that sort of thing actually takes place prior to the event. Um, <clears throat> they have, uh, typically they have two major Penzik staff meetings. One takes place within a couple of weeks after the event. And then the other one takes place about a month or so prior to the event. Um, and that's where they do that kind of stuff. You know, um, the guy running uh, Info Point says that he had been contacted by the, uh, the Butler Tourism Board and they wanted to know if there was anything that we needed from them, <laughs> you know, or, or did, you know, did we want to do some advertising in a local newspaper or, you know, stuff like that. So a lot of times the authorities reached out to us and in a number of cases, we reached out to them. You know, it was a good thing to let the people who operated 911 down in Pennsylvania in that area know that the event was starting. You know, so that if they got phone calls, you know, they, they'd know where it was and what was going on. So there was a lot of pre-notification. The, uh, the thing with the 10,000 cap, I mean, Never really got a good solid direct answer, but I know that there are regulations for large events. Um, Cooper's Lake actually hosts other events that are um, as big or in a couple of cases bigger than Penzik, although they tend to be short, like they'll have a weekend long event for some sort of motorcycle thing. Um, or now they have uh, they have a Jeep playground <laughs> uh, that's on the site now where I believe North Shield used to camp. Um, and they went and did some terraforming and threw a bunch of big logs and rocks and stuff out there. Um, and they have a big uh, four wheel drive event every year. And, uh, and that brings in several thousand people. Um, yeah, so the local authorities certainly know about us. And uh, for the most part, it's a matter of Hi, we're going to be here again. We're going to be doing our thing. Um, and these are things that are new for this year. You know, like when they when they shifted the archery field out to the way back beyond, um, we had to let the, uh, the EMS people know so that they could be prepared to have to drive out there if they needed. Um, yeah, 
I think it was the woods battle that caused them to go out and buy uh, one of those little four wheel, four, you know, four runner off road vehicle things. Um, At the old woods or the newer woods? The uh, newest woods or? Yeah, it was the, when they, I'm trying to remember now. I think that they bought that little critter when they shifted the woods battle to uh, the section out beyond the parking lot. Um, yeah. Hmm. yeah. So, That's inter it's interesting stuff I didn't even remember. <laughs> so you brought up the Coopers and the fact that they, of course, have other events and so forth going on. Did you get too much involved in the contract negotiations with them? And did you find any difficulties there? No, not really. Um, the uh, one of the handy aspects of Penzik is that it, it happened the year before, <laughs> you know. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of continuity from year to year. Of course, the uh, some of my information, of course, is outdated. Um, a lot of the dealings that I had relative to Penzik were with Dave Cooper, who has passed away. Um, and, uh, and I hadn't been involved with the new set of Cooper management because um, I decided to step down and retire from doing that event um, just because it is so much work. And uh, I started getting old and creaky. <laughs> um, How many hours do you think you were putting in on the Pen6? Oh my God, <laughs> lots. Um, as the... As the mayor of the event, technically speaking, you're on duty all the time, 24 seven, you know, and there are, there are things that you uh, provide information to public safety that if these things occur, wake me up, <laughs> you know, if it happens in the middle of the night, send somebody up to my camp and get me out of bed. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tremendous time commitment. Uh, prior to the event and after the event, there's just an enormous amount of contact, uh, sending people emails, making phone calls, saying, hey, you know, I was wondering if you could step up and be the, uh, the assistant deputy for fill in the blank. Um, or if you could arrange that your household can help out with the battlefield set up on this day. Um, the more of that kind of thing you can arrange prior to the event, the easier it is once you get down there. Um, yeah, that's, I couldn't, I couldn't really tell you just in terms of hours. Um, because the other thing too, is that it, it sort of ramps up, uh, a month after the event, you really don't have much to do except put your feet up and say, oh my God, I survived. <laughs> um, but as you get closer to the event, the amount of stuff that you have to do starts to increase. Um, <clears throat> talking about perks, and this really kind of only applies to the autocrat. Um, it's a heck of a lot of fun spending an awful lot of somebody else's money. <laughs> um, you know, and there's, there's some stuff that's kind of interesting, a, a little side story since we have time, I guess. Um, one, of the one of the things that I had done uh, way back when, when I was still working the Chiurgenate, is I noticed that the staff used a, a number of uh, handheld walkie-talkies uh, for communicating. And I found out that nobody knew where they came from or who owned them. And some of them had broken antennas, and some of them were missing the battery compartment door, and so on and so forth. So I took it upon myself. And what I did was at the end of the event, I took a tour around in my golf cart. And anytime that I spotted somebody with a radio, I said, excuse me, is that yours? And they said, no, it belongs to the event. I said, give it to me. <laughs> and I collected all of those radios, took them home and refurbished them all, put little stickers on them saying property of Penzik and brought them back the following year. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a fun, fun adventure. But, um, I had decided a couple of years later, of course, talking with some of the staff and past autocrat, uh, autocrat next year's autocrat, 
um, about the idea of buying some actual professional radio gear because the CVs didn't really do the job that we needed them to do. Um, and I ended up stopping at a, a place up here called Flower City Communications. Very pretty little chrome steel glass building. Um, secretary sitting behind a front desk, uh, in a very nice office. And, uh, and I walked in there, unfortunately, I walked in there uh, after having gotten there on my motorcycle. So I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt and a, and a little do-rag just like that guy has. Um, <laughs> and uh, walked into the place, the secretary said, hi. I said, hi, yeah, I'm looking to buy some radio gear. She said, okay. So she hooked me up with this salesman. And right from the beginning, as I was trying to explain to him what Penzik is, I could tell right from the beginning that he just thought I was some kind of nut. Um, so sort of reluctantly, he ended up showing me this radio. It was a little single channel radio. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I, I think that we're really going to need something that has more than one frequency uh, because we have, you know, 18 different departments. And, uh, you know, we don't want people to be stepping all over each other. And, and he looked at me and he said, well, you know, when you start getting into multi-channel radios, they start getting kind of pricey, right? And, and I, at that point, I said, okay, this guy isn't being very helpful. So I said, well, all right, thanks for your time. I got up, started to walk out of the office, and I paused in the doorway, turned around and looked at the guy, and I said, you know, not for nothing, last year we spent $28,000 on golf cart rentals. And I walked out, <laughs> um, ended up finding a different vendor for radio gear. And it was, uh, it was a, a little business operating out of a house called, uh, oh my God, what the heck were they called? TADA Communications. And, uh, and it was in a house. <laughs> and I walk in and there was a lady, you know, just casually dressed, uh, sitting at a desk, said, hi, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm interested in buying some radio gear. She said, oh, cool. I'll get Jim <laughs> to come out and talk to you. You want some coffee? Right. So I sat down with this guy and uh, told him what we did. And he, he seemed to be interested. And finally, toward the end of uh, the end of the time there, he had come out with this one radio. It was, uh, I think it was a 12 channel radio. Um, and I said, OK, I think that that's going to do what we needed to do. And, uh, and he quoted me a price. Um, and they were, I think, a couple hundred bucks a piece. Um, he quoted me a price and I said, okay, good. I'd like 30 of them. <laughs> and you should have seen the look on his face. He was like, oh my God. So it turns out that now, um, Penzik is their biggest customer, uh, with the exception of the Rochester city school district. And, uh, and they've gone over and above to take care of us because we're a very good customer. <laughs> but yeah, so the whole money thing was kind of fun. It was also a lot of fun learning how everything worked. You know, it's like I prior to getting deeply involved in the event from an administration viewpoint, I had no idea how complex and how big that event actually is. You know, I mean, we're talking 18 department heads, hundreds of volunteers. It's just uh, unbelievable and an awful lot of money. <laughs> So uh, I'm the uh, one of the one of the two autocrats for our kingdom's biggest event, uh, Battlemore, okay. which like Penzig, when we were uh, postponed, basically our whole staff has kind of stepped over. So we were informed this week that that we are in fact to go uh, for the moment, even though it's only a month after uh, we reopen. So our, our instructions from their majesties was uh, pretty much in a nutshell, prepare for everything. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so prepare for a low attendance, prepare for an extremely high attendance, prepare for cancellation. So uh, it's a little daunting mm -hmm. because especially, you know, last year, uh, and I believe it was for, uh, to be able to, uh, because of the contract, the contract that we had with the site, mm -hmm. uh, kind of waited till the very last minute to cancel or to, to basically to say the event wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, which was quite, quite stressful, uh, but uh, so uh, I probably have a ton of questions, mm -hmm. but nothing's coming to mind. <laughs> okay, well, my, I mean, my email is in the chat window. You can feel free to uh, start email, write up some questions. Sometimes that helps 
your thinking process to start writing yeah. stuff down. And, and if you lose it, uh, send me an email at Northern Seneschal and I can. Oh, great, Mr. Chester. Yeah, there you go. Appreciate that. So yeah, because I'm sure I'm sure at some point I will, we, you know, I will have some questions. Sure. Was, was the uh, that I was going to be able to do communication. The notification about preparing for anything. Um, Somebody, somebody was that because explained, like, no, you're un, like unsure not, about how like, it was going to work. Is that was that the primary drive? Terry, Al Terry, you mm -hmm. muted again. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in the same room with my wife. She's across the room, so I'm kind of in order to uh, keep the noise down. Um, anyway, um, thank you for doing that. Part of I think part of it is um, because we're going to be the first, pretty much probably one of the first large events uh, following, you know, a year of shut over a year of shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, their Majesties and I agree, uh, we may get a lot of a lot of higher attendance than we were expecting mm -hmm. um, last year. But then again, you know, depending on you know the rollout of the of the vaccines and how people are. If people are going to be cautious, we may get lower attendance. So, sure, we're kind of just, or it may get pushed back again. Yeah. What's the uh, kind of, what's the plan for that event for first aid services? We uh, we don't really. So that's kind of the kind of the tricky. We do have a first aid station, mm -hmm. but we don't really have, um, and it's it's manned pretty much. Uh, the whole event, but we don't have um, uh, more than the formal first aid station. We don't really have anything. We are in a small town that has that's. Um, yeah, sorry, um, we're not far from medical attention. Although the nearest hospital is an hour away, mm -hmm. there is there is first aid, and 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 they're within I think five minutes, five to seven minutes away. Mm. And uh, what's the expected attendance normally? See, last year we had just about just under three thousand, if I remember correctly. I, I don't have, I have the numbers clear in my head, but it's in that neighborhood. Okay, that's well, well, a sizable. Event. It's not a it's not a huge event compared to Penzig, but I mean it is mm -hmm. it is a larger. Uh, sure. And anything more than a couple dozen people, it ramps yeah. up the amount of planning and infrastructure and all of that. Um, the reason I asked about the first aid thing is that coming out of COVID, you know, vaccines or not, do you think that you're going to want to institute any kind of precautions? You know, um, I've you already, know. I've already considered that as a possibility. Yeah. In fact, that's something that I want to. I haven't even met. We haven't even met our staff yet. Mm -hmm. This meeting just took place. Okay. Um, so at some point early next week, I'm going to try and pull everybody together so we can actually discuss. And that's one of the things that I really want to make sure we have is is somebody who's, you know, we have a staff position that's in charge of ensuring that we are still following whatever protocols are in place at the time, right, uh, and such, because mm -hmm. I think that's really really important. Okay. Um, you know, I, you just talking about the the nearest towns uh, and ambulance service and whatever. This reminded me that way back when, <laughs> and this is just sort of a side story, um, way back when we had two different ambulance services, if you will. One was from Butler and the other was from Portersville, which is actually the township that the event takes place in. Um, the people from Portersville were very, very small, little volunteer, first responders they had a uh, they had a truck um similar to you see some of the smaller fire truck kind of things basically just like a pickup truck with a big box on the back um first aid supplies and splints and all that kind of jazz and what they would do their job was to hop in that thing drive to the site of an accident or whatever assess the situation stabilize the patient and then call for an ambulance to come and transport them because they didn't have a way to do their own transport. Now the people from Butler, for the most part, the uh, their volunteer ambulance people, they thought we were all Fruit Loops. 
And it came across pretty clearly in their attitude when they got out there. It was like, yeah, you guys are a bunch of nuts. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have to be here, that kind of thing. Whereas yeah. the folks from Portersville were like, oh my God, this is neat. How do I join? <laughs> you know. <laughs> in fact, they uh, they ended up running a, a little uh, food vendor thingy um, at the uh, at the event to pick up some money. But the problem was that they didn't have an ambulance. They couldn't transport anybody. So we went around and did a very aggressive drive for donations and we bought them an ambulance nice yeah <laughs> the thing that was neat about it was that we had had uh one of the uh scribal people or maybe more than one um they went and drew the uh the arms of all of the kingdoms at that time since we had people donate from everywhere um around the top edge of the ambulance on that little high top roof thing um and we presented it to them at the great court. And the, cool. you know, we, we, we have this little group of people. I you know there were like eight of them, you know, that are that are this little volunteer ambulance squad um, in court. And they have a thousand people cheering for them. They were crying like crazy. It was just, it was an awesome, awesome experience. And that made the entire event worthwhile for all of the chirogenic related volunteers that we had been able to do that for them and that they were just overwhelmed. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Anyway, one of the little perks. <laughs> uh, so yeah, feel free to scribble up some questions and shoot them off to me. I will do my best to answer. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. So he brings up something interesting. I might tack on after that is uh, you know, we're wondering if we're going to have an explosion of people or we're going to have a dearth of people or a normal amount. That's going to affect our funding, of course, too. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder how you took in some of those things for Penzik. I mean, Penzik is a little more stabilized. You got a pretty good idea that mm -hmm. you have you know, 10,000 plus people. Right. Uh, but they're, they're still clearly going to be overages and underages. So, mm -hmm. well, one of the advantages to Penzik that's kind of unique to that event is that because it happens every year and because it's, there's a, I think it was like 3%, there's a, there's like a 3% curve for attendance every year. It goes up just a little bit and there's, you know, it's within a bell curve. There's some little ups and downs, but for the most part, Penzik has gotten slightly bigger every year. And the way they handle funding is that there is, uh, you know, a Penzik account, and the money in that account from the previous year is what's used to pay for this Penzik. So going into the event, we don't necessarily have to worry about funding. What we have to worry about is having enough money, having generated enough money to be able to do the next Penzik. <laughs> um, you know, so it's sort of like having a you know a checking account with a bunch of money in it that you can use to pay your rent. But if you don't work and you get money in between, next year is going to be a problem. Um, they do they do a fair amount of work relative to seeking donations from people who do attend, um, and that that works out pretty well. It's. It's something that could potentially be a real problem if uh, if they decide to host Penzik and they plan for 10,000 people and 2,000 people show up, that's going to be a problem. Um, but I think the only thing that we can do, f you know, in terms of that is to have uh, people in charge, you know, whoever's going to be the autocrat, um, to keep an eye on the world, so to speak. You know, where are we at? Is there a vaccine? When is it coming out? Is it gonna work for everybody? Um, do we wanna require people to show proof of vaccination to get in? You know, things like that. That's all gonna be considered for next Penzik. And some of that, some of that's gonna be hard decisions. I, I don't envy the the current staff at all. They have a lot of a lot of questions that don't have answers. 
that they really are going to need answers for before they can say, okay, we're going to do the event. Tough stuff. I might, I might be able to come up with another one. I know we have about 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. uh, Eric, I want to make sure that you get your chances to ask questions or if anyone else does. Okay. I've actually been enjoying the questions. You've been coming up with a lot of great questions. So yeah, good so, job. Sa saving my brain. <laughs> we'll fire some more then. Uh, and this actually might impact Battlemore this year. We, we've actually started doing some land allocation at Battlemore. And at many of our other events, we haven't done that. Um, and Penzik is fairly smooth now, but have you noticed issues, especially now that you've, I mean, Penzik's expanded its land. Mm -hmm. Every year it seems like there's more. Yep. So uh, have you, can you talk a little bit to land allocation issues? Um, the, the process uh, that Penzik does in terms of land distribution has, has evolved over the years. And it's at the point where I think that it's pretty stable and it's about as good as it's gonna get. You know, they have a, there's a system whereby people sign up for land prior to the event. Um, I presume most of you guys have been to Penn's <laughs> um, No, okay. Um, there's a thing that they call a land lottery, uh, you know, where they have they have a sort of tiered preferential setup. You know, if, if your group has been in this particular block for the past five years, then it's a good chance that you'll be able to get that block again this year. Um, it's when new groups pop up that there are, you know, issues in terms of who goes there. Sometimes people want to change where they are. Um, you know, it's like, you know, I thought I'd like it down in the bog because it's nice and cool, but on the other hand, I got eaten alive by mosquitoes, so I want to move up to the Serengeti. Um, so that kind of stuff needs to get dealt with. For the most part, though, the system that they have works really remarkably well. You know, there are occasional problems. If we have two groups that want the same block, you have to, you know, go down and play diplomat, you know, and see if you and offer one of the groups to move to a place that's a little bit better. These guys have got shade. Would you be willing to move here? You know, that kind of thing to solve those sort of problems. Um, but there aren't a whole heck of a lot of them. Well, with this year with the COVID, do you see that being a particular issue? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That, the, that might play into things. Yep. The, uh, the questions are really stuff that we can't come up with an answer yet. You know, we can make we can make guesses and we can try and set stuff up for what if, you know, um, what if the attendance is only going to be 3000 people? What do we do? Um, and you can sit down and write up, you know, ideas and plans for how to deal with that. Um, but a lot of that stuff, we're not going to have an answer until we have an answer as to what's going on in the real world, you know, so to speak. You know, it's like I mentioned, you know, is is the vaccine going to be available to everybody? Um, is there going to be a good swing in terms of the people who are willing to go get the vaccine? Because there are a lot of people that are against the idea of vaccinations all the way around. Um, do we want to require that that takes place in order for people to attend the event? Um, you know, you got to show us a note from your doctor saying that you've received the vaccination or we don't let you in, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and there are decisions that are going to have to be made, but can't really be made until we know what's going on for sure. Try and think of some other ones. I see some other people have jumped on possibly for the class that's coming up, but uh, certainly uh, want, want to let other people ask questions. We and very much thank you, Baron Devin, for oh yeah coming and offering some expertise here. Sure. Actually, makes me feel good to be doing something worthwhile. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. Yeah.
Yes, thank, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, yeah. So I, I, for one, I appreciate it very much. Anytime. And I appreciate that uh, I'll be able to reach out to you at some point. Mm -hmm. Feel uh, free to pass that around too. If there may be somebody who uh, didn't attend this because they wanted to go to a different, uh, different class or whatever. So feel free to pass it around and let people know I'm available for questions. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if there's nothing else, I think I'm going to sign off and go find lunch. Understood. Appreciate it. All righty. Well, you guys take care and good luck to everybody. Thank you.